Well, welcome uh, to uh, the first spring event for preparing future faculty. Uh, we have an event, as it says up here, working with students with disabilities. And a question that many faculty ask, what can and should we do? Uh, we have uh, five panelists plus a moderator today. Uh, first of all, Beth Ann Dickey, who's acting director of the Office of Educational Accessibility, will be doing a, an overview of the resources available in her office. And then we will have a panel discussion uh, among several experienced faculty who have worked with students with disabilities in their classes, including uh, Jill Dustin, who's an associate professor of, in the Department of Counseling and Human Services, and Meadows, uh, associate director of the Commonwealth Special Education Endorsement Programs for the Virginia Consortium of Teacher Preparation and Visual Impairment. Jennifer Yonkin, who's a chief departmental advisor in my own psychology department with over a thousand majors. And I'm Frances Adams, chair and professor of the Department of Political Science and Geography. And uh, Dr. Robert Ratowitz has will act as a moderator of our panel discussion. Uh, with that, I will turn the um, program over to Beth Ann and uh, let her tell you what's available at ODU. Thank you. So, as Elaine mentioned, my name is Beth Ann Dickey. I'm the acting director over at the Office of Educational Accessibility. Up until about two years ago, our name was um, Disability Services. And we actually changed our name um, in order to, first of all, more explain what we do here on campus. And it really is to make educational accessible for students with disabilities. We also wanted to ensure that people felt comfortable walking through our doors. You know, our doors used to say disability services, and the students here on campus really didn't want to be associated with that name. So we changed it, and I think that we've had, it's been positive for most people. But um, that's where we came from. I'm going to be talking to you, giving you an overview of what services we provide here on campus and why we provide them before we then go to our distinguished panelists. But before um, we get started, I wanted you to do an activity because I want you to ha experience something that maybe you've never experienced before. So in front of you, you've just gotten the mirror maze, the piece of paper. Oh, you guys didn't get one. Elaine, do we have more? Here. There, if you could pass that down, you guys get to do it too. And if you need a pen, let me know. I pulled out a few from my purse. Does anybody need a pen? <laughs> and I know we're not at tables. It might be a little awkward, but I want you to give this a try. Um, this is what, if you look, everybody has a mirror and everybody has a piece of paper. What I would like you to do is put the mirror down on the top of that paper the best you can. Have the paper in your lap. Um, if you want to sit on the floor, you're more than welcome to do that too. But put the mirror at the top of the page. And when you look inside into the mirror, you're going to see the word name is oriented so you can read it. Do you see that? What I would like you to do is write your name on the line, and we want it on the line, in that same orientation. So you see that big N? Write your first letter of your name exactly in that same orientation of that N. And, but then write the full name on your line. Do you, do you have a mirror? Take a mirror. There you go. Cursive or printed? If you can do cursive, you move to the head of the class. <laughs> Look inside the mirror and read your name. And you don't have to worry, you're not going to be graded on it today. <laughs> no grades, no grades assigned. Elaine's not going to do anything about that today. And you see the opening of the maze? Follow the maze through without touching a line. Okay, you have about 10 more seconds. Come on, finish it up. 
<laughs> it's <laughs> so you can you can stop now. Just a few things. First of all, was the task easy? No. So let me hear. How did you feel during the activity? Frustrated. Lost. Like a five-year-old. Like a five-year-old. I heard laughing. I heard comments. All sorts of different things going on, right? So, yeah, but it was, it was frustrating, right? Now, let me ask, did you have all the skills necessary to do the task? Could you see the paper? Could you read the instructions? Did you understand my verbal instructions? Can you hold a pencil? Do you know how to write your name? Have you ever followed a maze before? You knew what to do, right? But you just couldn't make it work. There was a disconnect between what you visually saw and thought and what motorically you were supposed to do. It didn't happen. I love this activity because this is the best activity I've ever been able to find that would simulate what it would be like to have a visual motor processing disorder. And if you look, if you look at the copyright of this, it's 1973. This has been around. I can't recreate it. That's why it's kind of crooked and all of that. But it is just such a great way for you to get a feel of what somebody who had this type of disorder would feel like on a day-to-day -day basis. Now think about it. If, this is, if you had this disorder and you had this, how would this impact your life? Think about your classrooms that you teach, where you're giving lectures. How would those students be in your class? Would they be able to keep up with your lectures? No, they wouldn't. They'd probably be very frustrated. Um, that's what we, my office, is here to do, is for people like this who are smart, very highly, you know, they got into ODU just like everybody else. They are intelligent, they understand, and they want to understand what's going on in your classes, but they can't keep up with the written notes. So what do we do? We make sure that they have note takers in class, or they're able to tape record their classes. We provide the accommodations that are necessary to kind of level the playing field for them. So they can be here learning and all of that, and this one little area doesn't hold them back. The mission of the Office of Educational Accessibility is to advocate for students here on campus who have disabilities to ensure that they get appropriate accommodations um, in their classes and throughout campus. We want to make sure they have equal access to instruction, to activities. We want to ensure that they're accepted on the university campus. And we also really work with them to learn how to self-advocate because they come here freshman year straight out of high school and, who, and where they've been taken care of either by their parents or by case managers in schools have been doing all this for them. They come in and have to learn how to do it themselves and to talk to you teachers and the, all their teachers about the accommodations that they need. And they're going to take what they learn self-advocacy wise out into the working world. World. So they need to learn here, how do I go about talking about these issues and the accommodations that I might need. So that's what we do. And we exist because of the, the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, it was enacted in 1990, previous to this was Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. But ADA really put some teeth into the fact that we need to provide equal access to people with disabilities. And it covers employers, it covers um, transportation, telephone services, but then also people who provide public um, services and who receive federal funding. We as an institution receive federal funding. All of those, you know, the financial aids monies, all of that, the grant monies that we get, institution thrives on federal funding so we must adhere to the ADA and ensure that students with disabilities receive equal access so that's why we're here um, 
in order for a student to get accommodations here, they must provide our office. And this is important that not all faculty really know. They have to provide us with documentation of the disability. And the documentation standards are, they're actually, we set them, but they're also set by our national organization of, um, of disability service providers. But um, we look for documentation that's current Within the last three years, we need documentation. We need it from a qualified examiner. And um, we need it to state what the disability is, how it impacts the student, and we like to get some suggestions from the, uh, the examiner of what accommodations might be necessary. But then we get this in, we review it. We ensure that, yes, there is indeed a disability that would impact the person's ability to access the college campus, and we develop accommodations with them. But we do make sure that there really is a disability in existence, um, and that we do have full documentation before we move forward with accommodations. And we have various types of disabilities, categories of disabilities on ODU's campus. Um, start with physical disabilities. These are the ones that you see, and they're most readily available for you to see on um, the students who use wheelchairs and it's kind of interesting I see plenty of students using wheelchairs on campus who are not registered with our office and I think that speaks to the fact that our campus is very accessible so they don't feel like they really have to utilize our service but we do have other students with disabilities um, who can't access say textbooks or taking notes like you were just trying, so we do have to really accommodate them. We also um, have a lot of students in the fall who have temporary mobility disabilities. Um, for, with the football team, we end up with a lot of football players with injured knees, ankles, all of that, that we golf cart around, or the skateboarders. They, you know, fall off their skateboards and they injure a leg or, interestingly enough, they tend to injure their wrists because they fall on their wrists and we have to scribe a lot of tests for them um, temporarily. And those calculus three tests, trying to scribe those are not the most fun things. But we have to ensure equal access. So um, we do have students with physical disabilities here. We um, have students with visual disabilities and they can either be blind classified as blind or have a visual impairment. Currently, we don't have any students who are legally blind on campus. We have a lot with vision impairments, um, and that comes with our maturing population, our mature learners coming back. Um, and a lot of these students, all they really need is to ensure that they can sit up front in their classrooms so they can see the board, um, or maybe they do need a large text provided to them on their test and we can do things like that. So we have visual disabilities. We also have um, students with hearing impairments and you can either be deaf or you can have a hearing impairment. Students with hearing impairments might just need priority seating again, maybe some note taking. But um, then we do have students on campus who utilize interpreters. And the interpreter stands in front of class and just interprets through most, well, we actually have two types of um, languages being used by interpreters on campus. We have American Sign Language, which is the most common. We also have uh, one student who used transliteration, where they actually um, sign each phoneme of, I believe it's each phoneme, is that right? Of the English language? <laughs> you would know, right? <laughs> so, um, but we, we provide those services for the students. And just, you know, a little caveat with that, if you're ever teaching a class um, or interacting with somebody who utilizes an interpreter, always talk directly to the student that you're trying to talk to. Don't turn and look at the interpreter and talk to them thinking they'll translate it. The student and the interpreter know how to work it out. They'll work it out. Look and you know, respect the person that you're talking to. So just my little caveat there. 
Um, we have lots of students with learning disabilities on campus. Uh, maybe it is dyslexia where they have issues with the written print and reading written print. And for those students, uh, we can get electronic textbooks for them. So publishers will release to us electronic versions of their textbooks as long as they know that the person has actually gone out and purchased the book. Then they'll release it to us so the students can load the textbook up onto their computer and have the computer read it to them. Or some students with physical disabilities utilize that so they can just you know turn the page they, if they can't physically turn the page themselves. Uh, so learning disabilities that way. We have some students who have dyscalculia, and it's really interesting that you know some students really cannot do the mental calculations. So they might have to use a calculator, which I know is against the math department's policy of, you know, the lower levels, no calculators, but with these students, they have to have it. Because they can understand, just like you with, this phys with the physical that you just went through, they can understand the math concepts. It's just sometimes that rote, multiplication, whatever, they just can't get. So we work with them. And some students have processing delays where it just takes longer. They can read it, they can do it, but it might take them a little bit longer to do it. We have a lot of students with ADD and ADHD on campus. Uh, it was really interesting last fall, I looked at the early alert list, you know, the first round of grades, and took a look at all of our students who were on that list, and a huge number of those students on the list fell into the ADHD. And what it is, is getting them organized and actually doing assignments and turning them in on time. That is one of the hardest things for them to do. They tend to put things off, put things off, and then it doesn't get turned in, or not on time, and they're counted late for that. So we work, I do a lot of organizational work with um, our students with ADHD. Beginning of the semester, bring me all your syllabi, let's write it all down, get it all on paper, let's make sure you know what's coming your way. And that's really important. Then we week by week can go through and say, okay, what do you have to do? I have one student who comes to see me every week, and she just comes in and da 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 da, talks, 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 talks. And all she wants to do is tell me all these things that she has to do because they're making her very anxious and she doesn't know how to organize it. And as she's talking, I just kind of write out, okay, Monday, this is what she needs to be doing, Tuesday. And I just kind of write out, okay, this is your list, this is your to do list, go. She goes, she gets it all done, she comes back to me the next week. Okay, this is everything that's due. Da, 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 da. And, you know, and just doing that is getting her through, and she's actually dean's list in the biology department. She just needs to have somebody help her get it organized. And I need to figure out how to help her then move from, shift from me to her doing it more, but right now it's working. Uh, we have a lot of students with psychological disabilities. May it be vets who are coming back um, with post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, it could be people at this age, in the college age, is when bipolar disorder and schizophrenia start ma manifesting themselves in a lot of students. So we have those um, disabilities on campus. It can be severe stress and anxiety disorder. And, you know, all of our students on campus, when it comes to major exams, experience stress. But if you have a generalized anxiety disorder related to tests, there are physiological symptoms that you start manifesting. It is not just, oh, I'm really anxious, I'm not sure if I can do this. Physiologically, they're feeling this. And we have to make sure that they are accommodated. Our most common thing is we have a testing room in our office that can accommodate 25 students at a time. But it's a quiet environment. It's an environment that they get used to. It's their place where they take tests on campus. They know us. They know that they can walk out of the test, leave it there, walk out, talk with us to kind of bring the stress down, go back in. But it starts be becoming a real comforting place, believe it or not, for them to be. And so they can come in and they can get extra time so they can walk away from the test if they need to and come back in. Uh, we have a lot of students, or a growing number of students, who are on the autism spectrum, which in, in the case of when they're at college, it would be the students with Asperger's syndrome. And um, they're, they're a fascinating group of kids. I love them. I see them all the time. Um, they're, they're students who have great difficulty with understanding 
social interaction, social reciprocity, um, taking somebody else's view of things. They tend to be very interested in a subject, which college is a great place for them to be because they can eventually really put all of their energies and mental efforts into whatever field it is that they want to take part in. Getting them through gen eds is really hard because why do I have to do this? This doesn't mean anything. And you know, and I have to talk to them, this is a check. You just got to check that box. If you want to graduate, if you want to go build that model, whatever you want, want to build, you've got to check this box off. And it's really hard to motivate them and get them through those things. But um, they're, they're a fun group. I like them. Uh, we also have students with medical disabilities. And medical disabilities can range from sickle cell anemia. Students, a lot of students here have it. And they might ha go into an attack in the middle of the night. And they have to get rushed, be rushed to the hospital. Our common accommodation for them is allowing them unexcused absences. They can't help when something like this is going to come on and they can't be penalized for being in the hospital because of it. So they've got to be allowed those absences and they've got to be allowed to make up those tests that they might have missed because it's not like they're missing it because they just don't want to take it. They have a physical reason why they are. So, um, but the big why in the medical disabilities, you know, we also have, say, students with Crohn's disease. And we have to write accommodations saying, please allow them to leave the classroom. Because there are some professors on campus who will lock the door to their classroom. Once they've walked in, they don't want anybody coming in late. They don't want anybody leaving early, so they lock the door. <coughs> And we have to write that so these kids, if they've got to use the restroom, they've got to use the restroom. And you can't stop them. So that's kind of the range. Any questions? And we really do look at everybody individually, because one student with ADHD is one student with ADHD. And we have to look at, OK, how is this impacting you? And what do you need to level that playing field? So common accommodations, I've actually talked through most of these. We allow a lot of students extended time on tests. This is our most common accommodation. So that they can either process, if they have delayed processing, they can have that extra time. If they have difficulty reading, they have the extra time to read. If you've got stress, they can kind of take their times through the test. So that is, and the distraction reduced environment um, is what we refer to as our, as our testing room. Um, we have volunteer note sharing, so somebody in the class can take notes for students. We have a form that we ask professors to send around class, and students fill in you know, their names if they'd be interested in helping. And then our office facilitates the exchange of those notes. Um, electronic textbooks, like I said, for students with learning disabilities, physical disabilities, we get electronic textbooks for them so they can be read. Um, excused absences. I think I've talked through every one of these. Interpreting services. Uh, what else? Braille notes. We don't have, like I said, anybody blind at campus right now requiring Braille. Last year and previous to that, we did. And we actually had to Braille PowerPoint notes for her and all different sorts of things. It was really fun. And it, we are blessed to have on our campus the um, Virginia, one of the Virginia Assistive Technology Labs, and they have a Braille machine. A Braille textbook can cost upwards of $45,000. You know, people complain for a $250 book, but you know, because of the time and energy involved. So for this particular student, what we would do, we'd get the electronic books for her so they could be read to her, but then we'd Braille out notes, PowerPoints, things like that. Our uh, GAs had a lot of fun doing that and tests. And actually, it was really funny. We went down, we were trying to, it was for a geography test, we were trying to braille out something and we thought we had it made. We actually went to TCC because they have a better brailler than we do. And came back, put it down in front of her, like, yes, we got it done. And she started feeling it and she's like, I'm sorry, but this is just says ones and twos. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> we had no idea because we don't read Braille. But you know, the whole, you know, it was like stacked this thick, and all it said was ones and twos. But um, it, was, it was a good challenge. That's what I liked about it. And we'll enlarge text for students, uh, make sure that they know what assistive technology is out there to support them. And um, we do the golf cart mobility assistance. This is what our letters look like. Mm -hmm. Just a general question. Uh, I mean, those accommodations are mostly for students who have uh, disabilities. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering if uh, uh, do you uh, you have uh, training or some sort of program that professors go through such that at least they're able to notice that the student may have a disability because. Uh, at least for me, by attending this, I know that, hey, uh, if I become a professor, I don't have to assume that uh, a student is just being lazy I, because, you know, it's mm -hmm. speed that may have, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering if it's, uh, this program is also available for... We do go, we go out and we talk to faculty. He was wondering if we have training for faculty so that they're able to know if a student has a disability uh, and so they can help them. Is that essentially? Um, and we do, we, we talk with faculty, we talk to staff about what we do and what our services are. Um, but really, when it comes down to it, after we provide accommodations, I know this is far away, it's up to the student to self-disclose that they require accommodations. And the way they do it, and it's not unique to us, this is at any university you go to, they have letters, accommodation letters, that they bring to professors. So this is what one would look like. It's blurry, I'm sorry, but it says faculty accommodation letter. It has the student's name and the semester, and it outlines the accommodations that they require. So they bring it to you, and then you'll know. So you won't have to figure out, oh, do they need this, do they need that? It says it. And that's what they're requiring. And so, and then what we also, they need to do this, and this is what the whole self-advocacy self piece, we talk to them. They should be approaching instructors and talking to instructors, they should be, we tell them to. Um, they don't always, they might just hand it to professors right at the change of classes, like here and sign, then professor sign this for us. So we know that they've actually received the letters. Um, and you know, they'll just sign this and they don't want to talk anymore about it. We do try to get them explaining and interacting with professors. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I've noticed like, uh, I'm a, I mean, I'm a TA. Mm -hmm. So I've noticed that, uh, I mean, the kind of letter you send has like many options, like kind of accommodations mm -hmm. could do. But I normally don't see students like explaining that right in the beginning. And then as the semester goes on, like they kind of tend to make excuses of different kinds. How do we handle that? They shouldn't be. You call us, we'll talk to them. But um, this, it's really not, that list really isn't an option. Those are accommodations that they need to be provided through under ADA. Those are their accommodations. They might not choose to always use them. And that's up to the students. A lot of students might give you an accommodation letter, but then say, I'm going to try to take the test in the class with everybody else. And they might go take that test and they realize, ooh, I really should have taken it with us, so they might choose then later to do the other. But if it's an accommodation like note sharing and they don't ask you for it until right before final exams, call us. We'll talk with that student because, you know, they should be doing this up front. And it's important for you all to know that you don't have to provide accommodations. And actually, we don't want you to provide accommodations until you get those letters. Because, number one, you don't know what really they should be getting. And you don't know if it's legally really something they should be required to have. And we tell the students it's not retroactive. So if you've waited, you didn't give them their letters until after that midterm that you bombed. You cannot go into a professor and say, oh, I should have gotten extended time on the test. Can I retake the midterm? <laughs> no, they can't do that. Um, it, there, are, there are occasions where a student might get diagnosed mid-semester, and it always shocks me how many students don't get diagnosed with disabilities until college. I come from working in schools, and I thought the schools were covering everybody, and then I come here and it's like, oh my God, there's still like so many students who are undiagnosed. And it might be because 
they were able to get through until the higher level things are applied. It might be that parents didn't want them diagnosed with a disability. So there are different things at play. I don't want to waste up too much time, but let me say, consider accommodations when planning activities. If you have a lab, say, where you're going to have a lab quiz, think about if the kid gets extended time on test, when are they going to take those lab quizzes? And most, oh, and I, Kat, just to let you all know, what we do is we send out letters. Like, students have to request to take tests with us. And we send an email to you as a professor to say, so-and-so is going to take this test in our office. Please get it to us. So will you get it to us before your lab? Think about that. Let the, let the kid come in to our office, take that test first, and then go into lab. How are they going to get that extended time? So consider those things. Um, help to identify possible note takers if it's needed, if you get the request for that. You as a professor will know who's really taking the good notes. You can stand up and you know who's doing that. So if you can kind of help to identify that, that would be great. Um, ensure that tests are in our office when they need to be. So that students, actually, when they show up, the tests are there. We have student workers who will run out and pick them up, but you didn't just hear that from me. So <laughs> just make sure that, and never disclose a disability to anybody else. So say you get the form for the note takers. What you do is just stand up in front of class and say, um, I'm going to pass around this form if you're interested in helping take notes um, in the class for other students who might need them. Please sign up. So to make it, you don't say, Johnny over here needs notes taken for him. Who's going to help him? You can't do that. Um, then what you can do to help, and this is really important. I see this so much. Write syllabi that are clear and concise. I've seen syllabi that you have the department syllabus, and you've got my own class syllabus. And then on Blackboard, there's another listing of assignments that are due. Put it in one place. These kids with ADHD, the kids with Asperger's, let me tell you that just, they can't wrap their head around it. Um, and, and others. Anyway, and it's a good practice for all your students. If you want them to know, have it listed out. Nice, clear, concise. And you know, if you can make it so, math assignments are always due on Friday night at 11.59. But so it's something that's consistent so all students know what to expect. It's good practice, I believe, for everybody. The clear, concise directions for assignments. Not just go write a research paper on this book, but what do you want from it? What do you really want them to be targeting in? Um, if you can, provide examples of successful papers, projects. It just to see it might then help somebody actually be able to get started on it. Sometimes just the not knowing what it's supposed to look like will hold them back from ever getting started. Um, if you can, post your PowerPoints before class so these students can print them out and have them to refer to right in front of and can take notes right on that. Um, Archive your classes, if at all possible. There are some classes where it is mediated, and they can uh, get it taped and archived. If it's possible, do it and allow it to be available to everybody. Um, and talk with students about their needs. If you get an accommodation letter and they just throw it at you, maybe you want to say to them the next class, hey, why don't you come in during my office hours so we can talk? So then you get a chance to interact, find out what's going on, what they might need, and to get that conversation going. And then, let me see, why won't it go? There. What you can do to help is also refer people to our office. Like I just mentioned, students aren't all getting diagnosed before they come to college. So if you see somebody who's struggling to keep up in class, has difficulty focusing on tasks, turning in assignments, um, difficulty with writing. We're working a lot with that whole writing sample placement test. These kids that are in 050. Do they have some disability that we don't know about? Um, and those students who are having trouble with those subtle social interactions, the group work, all of that, refer them. What you might want to do is, again, pull them in to your office hours, say, hey, why don't you stop by? I want to, you know, let's talk about some things. And just see, you know, have you always had issues writing papers? Has it always been a struggle for you? Did you ever receive help? 
in your writing? Um, and what kind of help? And if they say IEP, if they say 504, I had a special educator, anything like that, then you can just say, hey, there's us. But you could also say there is an office that can see if maybe there's a reason you're having issues and refer them to us. I have brochures up here that you can pick up on the way out. I won't pass those around. And so that you'll know where we are. We're in the Student Success Center now. And that's our phone number. Um, any questions? Very good. Thank you, Bethan. Thank good. you. Sorry. It took a while. Um, first, I, I'm curious if the panel has any uh, general comments or observations based on what Beth Ann just presented to us. And then I'm going to introduce a couple of general topical questions that we can um, begin to have a conversation with around the room. I just wanted to point out that in terms of, of students with disabilities on campus, there are the students who are being served by the Office of Educational Accessibility, but there's also a contingent who don't self-identify and um, so are therefore, you know, without accommodations letters, but they represent a, a population we should probably be aware of. Yes, actually, I guess I want to make sure I can be heard. We, um, by the end of the end of last semester, we had 580 students registered with our office. The estimates are 11% of the college population has a disability of one form or another, and that, what I not do mathematician not right now, but we had about three plus percent of the population actually registered in our office. So there are a lot of students out there who are not identified, not self-disclosing to us, but they're out there on campus. I think that <clears throat> faculty members in general tend to be uh, very sensitive and supportive of students with disabilities and try to ensure that those students can do well and, and succeed in the class and, and have the same opportunities as other students. But it is that issue of the students who haven't yet been diagnosed or, or self-identified um, and they may be reluctant to. Uh, there, there may still be, unfortunately, kind of a stigma here that students uh, don't want to go that step. Uh, and so it can be challenging for faculty members to work with those students to ensure that they can also succeed. We had a student who was unable to pass a PhD comprehensive exam, uh, although he had done very well uh, in his courses, but to do the comprehensive exam takes a different type of abilities, and those abilities he really didn't have because of a learning disability, and uh, would have had to drop out of the program uh, if we hadn't um, encouraged him uh, to meet with your office uh, and to kind of go through the process. And he was reluctant, I think, to acknowledge that this was an issue. Uh, and so faculty members sometimes can be helpful in, in trying to encourage students to uh, recognize any difficulties that they might be experiencing. In special ed, we're, we're sort of in love with a, a concept called Universal Design for Learning, UDL. You probably heard about it in some other places as well. And it talks about sort of diversifying your instruction to cover all students, identified, unidentified, <coughs> sleepy, you know, English language learners, etc. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested in learning, you know, the concepts of Universal Design for Learning, you can check out the website. It's C A S T. Dot org. I think it's Center for Applied Special Technology. And it just talks about diversifying your method of instruction to reach all students. It's good stuff. And, and if I could add one thing to the general observations just made, um, it is the thoughtful and supportive faculty member who really does look out for students' best interests and coaxes them into uh, meeting with the people um, with accessibility services so that they succeed academically. Um, I had a situation a couple of years ago where a student did not register uh, with the office, um, had 
a significant dyslexia problem, and it was really hurting his grade. And he did go to the office. It wasn't really in time uh, to prop up his grade for that semester. But I think in future semesters, um, uh, he did significantly better as a result. So um, all very good. And um, at this point, I think we will go into some of the general panel questions. And um, I'll start by saying uh, that Beth Ann has presented us with a number of um, specific terms uh, used to describe um, uh, different kinds of uh, issues that these students face. And one is learning disabilities. A second is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. Physical disabilities, psychological disabilities, hearing impairments, visual impairments, autism spectrum disability, or Asperger's, and medical disabilities. Okay, and so for the panel, and then for the audience, um, if you would um, uh, begin a conversation with the panel, first question is try to think of a specific instance when a student with one of the above disabilities was in your class. Describe any accommodation that you made to assist that individual with mastering the material in the course. And I'll throw one out um, as a starter. Um, in fall of 2011, so just last semester, and then the previous fall, uh, 2010, I had a student in my art history class who had a hearing impairment, I think actually it was deafness. And she had to educate me very persistently to lecture in her direction. And I'm a pacer in the classroom, and so I would you know, walk around the room and sometimes I would talk to the screen, and other times I might talk to someone back there. And if she is sitting here, and her primary mode of understanding is through lip reading, I was not helping her. And so I had to modify the way that I moved in the classroom so that I could still keep the attention of students around the room, but I could at least have my lips in the direction <laughs> of the student, even if I might be gesturing or looking in a different area. I was just careful not to keep turning my head in a way that impeded the flow of communication. So, um, panelists, what do you think? Um. What came to mind first was a student that I had in my class in the summer, and he had a visual impairment. And some of the accommodations that I made for him was to make sure that all the handouts had at least a 28-point font on them. Um, I made sure that most of my information um, was available on Blackboard, so he could increase the font to a size that, that helped him. Um, I also made sure that my exams were available um, for him in the 28-point font, and also I didn't use OpScan uh, exams in that particular class. Uh, some things that I learned later on, um, he did have priority seating in the class, but you know, students come into your classroom and they throw their book bags on the floor and things like that. Well, I, need, I made sure that there was a clear path for him. Yeah. Um, some of those things, again, you don't think of at the time, but it was really important. Um, and I'll talk later on about an assignment that I had that I uh, accommodated for him mm -hmm. uh, that I never again thought about until he was in my class, how important that is to accommodate assignments, especially group projects mm -hmm. for students that may have a disability. Uh, I did other things for him, but those are the things that stick out the most. Well, I'll take a turn since I haven't uh, said anything yet. Uh, a lot of this is definitely best practices, and I think with the evolution of technology, it's a wonderful asset for all of us. I know when I started teaching 14 years ago, you know, we didn't have Blackboard. We had to increase handouts, like a larger font. I mean, there was a lot of things. So now, a lot of this stuff, you can appeal to the visual learner, the auditory learner. You can, you know, have everything preloaded in Blackboard so everything's accessible and they can, you know, adjust it to where they need it adjusted and, and so on. Um, I've had a lot of different interesting encounters over the time uh, with different differently abled individuals in my classes. I've had folks who have had cerebral palsy who are blind students with, um, you know, hearing issues, couldn't hear and had a, you know, signer in the class and uh, interpreter, signer. Um, folks with mental disorders who disclosed stuff and you just kind of have to 
remain <laughs> neutral. And so I guess the best advice is to be be prepared for anything and just kind of remain stoic when you need to because uh, it's an interesting journey with all these different people and the potential interactions you can have uh, to communicate, obviously, with the Office of Educational Accessibility to say, okay, you know, if, if I have an individual with any sort of disability, you know, how can I better you know, communicate and, you know, uh, improve my teaching abilities for a person with these types of needs. And that said, also communicating with the student. I think that's, you know, a, a crucial thing to say, okay, well, what have your previous experiences been like? You know, what's best helped you in a class? And to kind of adopt some of those things. So. You know, remaining neutral, mm -hmm. remaining non judgmental, very important, of course, remaining confidential. Um, perhaps most important of all. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm an adjunct professor, and so strangely I find myself teaching on TV a lot. <laughs> so, And one of the main courses I teach is a special ed law class, so when somebody comes in with an accommodations letter, you know, we, we know what to do. But it's amazing, as Jennifer was saying, how the technology has sort of accommodated all students. I mean, all of our classes are archived. All students can rewatch them, you know, at any time. Um, in terms of note taking, we tend to post everything on Blackboard. They can use their web browsers to increase the font size of you know, whatever we put out there. So um, a lot of it, and they tend to test on Blackboard. They get to pick the distraction-free environment where they are. So technology has really been a big boon in that sense. And it has helped. To us and to the students, yeah. yeah. I have yeah. a colleague who uh, <clears throat> had a student who was visually impaired, and uh, the student had difficult time seeing the PowerPoint presentations in the classroom, but there was an easy way to assist the student. Uh, that was to send the PowerPoint presentations in advance via email so that the student could have an opportunity to see them uh, in advance of the class session and that greatly facilitated their ability to understand what was happening in each of the classes. I'll just to add one final thing uh, to this question and um, I, since I teach art history um, the occasional visually impaired student who comes into my class faces special challenges as you can imagine and I've been teaching long enough so that projecting slide images was the norm when I first started here at the university and a student who uh, was in the art education program and uh, very um, uh, eager to succeed and of course uh, had needed my class to uh, complete the program was not only accommodated in the front row, so we reserved a seat for him, but he actually worked with um, jeweler's glasses. I mean, he had, he was um, legally blind, but uh, had the ability to at least make out shapes and other kinds of things, and was actually very successful in the class. I mean, he um, used the limited technology that was available, let's say, in 1991, and, um, and uh, made it through. And so um, we should, commend students who are that motivated um, and um, take joy in their success because we're a part of that too. I'm going to um, ask the second question, but before I do, I'm going to actually be walking around with the camera. We need to um, uh, sort of enhance our web presence and we've been trying to get some candid shots of uh, these sessions, uh, students, and I might even ask one or two of you to stay behind and hold up the mirror and pretend that you're doing um, <laughs> the, uh, the session, um, the exercise, uh, so that we can capture that moment as well. I was sorry that I didn't think of it beforehand, but I just saw the camera now. And so um, I will ask this question and step away from the podium uh, discreetly. Um, so for the panel, in the above situations, do you find any aspect of the accommodations particularly challenging? Uh, we've all sort of you know, said that, oh, this was you know, wonderful and we all benefited and so forth, but there must be an occasion where you're really sort of confounded, like what can I possibly do? And so, uh, if so, please describe what those issues were and how you responded uh, to the challenges they posed. Okay. Okay. Um, I actually had two situations with the same student that 
it was a little bit challenging, but it worked out. One was, um, it was a summer institute hybrid course, so the students met online for five weeks before we met for a full week on campus. And uh, this particular student, um, there was an assignment where they met on the discussion boards on uh, Blackboard. And the student posted messages and so forth using a very large font, like about a 32-point font. And one of the students in his group, because no one had met yet, said, your postings make me laugh every time with your large font. And I'm reading this, and I thought, okay, what do I do? I didn't want to disclose to the student, you know. And she kept saying stuff. I laugh every time I look at your big letters, you know. And so I contacted the student and asked him, you know, would you like me to um, intervene? He said, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine. And it went on for a couple of weeks, and finally he disclosed. Well, you can imagine how horrified the student was, because she had no idea, and she, you know, had no idea, so she just felt horrible about it. But he worked, you know, through his, don't worry, you know, it happens all the time. So that was one situation that I didn't expect. The other one was one of the assignments in that week-long institute was a poster session where students would create a poster on school-based enterprises and then present them just as if they were in a conference. And we had a smaller room, but um, I was concerned that with all the posters around the room that this individual would have difficulty you know, maneuvering around the room without tripping on something. So I divided the poster session into three different sessions, and the sessions were clumped together. So he could actually walk into the room and stand at one place in the room and view all the posters. Um, that way, you know, he didn't have to worry about tripping on anything. And the other thing I did, um, each of the students enlarged a brochure and their handouts in 28 plus point font. Um, so he was able to, of course, read, you know, the, the um, handouts. And all the posters were at least 28 point font, but they were a lot larger than that to accommodate him as well. Um, so those are the two things that happened that, you know, caught me off guard a little bit, but it all worked out and it wasn't a big issue. The um, interpreters were working from the partial notes as well, but I have much more detailed notes that I lecture from. I consider that my intellectual property. Um, so after a class session or two, one of the interpreters came up and she just looked exhausted. She'd been trying to sign you know, everything I said and most of what I say is not in the partial notes because I assume that they can see the slide and then I elaborate verbally, you know, on what's on the slide. And they asked for my, you know, full notes, the entire set of notes, which, you know, of course I gave, but that was, that was, you know, a time when that's not something I would normally do. Was, that's my lecture. <laughs> I had a student who I believe had Asperger's syndrome. Uh, it was the first semester, actually, I was here at ODU and not a whole lot of experience in dealing with this type of a situation. Um, and it was very challenging. Um, the, the difficulty is that you, on the one hand, want to ensure that that student has every opportunity that all of the other students have. On the other hand, the behavior in the classroom was disruptive and and undermining the learning experience for the other students. So it's a real challenge in terms of how to uh, best handle that type of a situation. What I did was try to talk with that individual student one-on-one, -on -one, privately, outside of the classroom, and it took a number of meetings with him, actually. Um, initially, he was um, not very uh, responsive to the, um, the concerns that I was uh, raising, um, kind of defensive about it. And, and that can be a, an aspect of Asperger's syndrome, is, to, is to, to not kind of pick up on, on uh, verbal cues that uh, others are provide. But over time, we kind of worked it out. Over time, it got better. Over time, in these conversations that I was having with him, we kind of reached a better understanding, and he started to um, uh, act in a way in the classroom that was less disruptive. Um, I don't know if I handled it as well as I could have. Um, I found that the situation was was quite difficult in, in many respects because he would 
uh, be fixated on certain things that made it difficult to move on <laughs> to different topics. Uh, to you wanted to talk quite a bit in the class, and that was um, you know kind of taking space away from the other students in the class. And the comments were not often very helpful, and so it it was causing other students to be frustrated. Uh, and so dealing with a situation like that, there's maybe no real good. Uh, guidelines on how best to handle it, it would be pretty much of an individual uh, uh, approach that one would have to adopt. But I found uh, talking with him and being sympathetic and supportive and not being accusatory and not placing blame on him or anything, but trying to find a way that we could uh, work best together tended to be the, the most appropriate way to handle that. I'll add to what Francis has just said because um, in the same class where I had the hearing impaired students, uh, student, I had a um, student whom I believe had Asperger's, although she did not self-identify, and there was no accommodation letter. Um, I had known this student uh, informally uh, from substituting in some colleagues' classes over the uh, past couple of semesters and knew that she would sort of blurt things out in a way that could be potentially disruptive. And so um, what surprised me um, was how in the fall class when she saw me on a regular basis, um, I think her anxiety level decreased because she knew how I taught and, um, and what to expect. And in this particular situation, the students in the class accommodated her in a way that was very uh, patient and understanding. And I, I wonder if it has to do with a generation of students who have grown up with students with disabilities being mainstreamed into elementary and secondary classrooms. And so if um, my student needed to get up and pace as a way of reducing her anxiety, she would do it and no one would even notice it. I mean, it was just the sort of thing uh, that they um, expected. She was very quiet. She would sit down. And, you know, I learned to ignore it as I was teaching. And it turned out well. But I know that I was lucky. Um, it could have been a less, um, certainly a more challenging situation, I should say. And um, we have to be prepared to think creatively and to respond accordingly. So. Um, and yes, please. There are a lot of the students with Asperger's who do want to blurt out, ask a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. They need to get that answer. And um, with some students, we say, okay, three questions, that's it. Write the rest of your questions down, and maybe you can email them to your professor at a later time. But because we'll have to sit down and kind of set those limits for the students. Right. Right. After we've talked with the professor, we meet with the student and say, okay, this is the mm -hmm. limit. This is what you should need to try. And that really has worked. And making sure also if they need to get up and pace, they're sitting at the back of the room. Right. So they right. can get up and it's not disruptive. Right. So yeah. we kind of we're we're we talk through these issues mm -hmm. with the kids. I know the panel's already responded to this next question in um, sort of uh, oblique ways, but uh, I'll just throw this out. Um, have you changed your presentation manner in a way uh, that um, benefits students who need accommodations? Or in other words, what have you done differently um, in a situation? And I want to say, Jill, you were going to tell us something about an earlier presentation, or was that the poster? That, that right, was, that was, that was the poster, poster session. So that's uh, one example. Uh, certainly, right. you know, my um, willingness to keep my mouth focused in the direction of the student lip reading uh, would be another. Um, panelists, any other things that you uh, I think have just done being differently? Conscien yeah. Conscious, of, or conscious, con you know, just keeping yeah. track of PQs. You know, mm -hmm. like I know that one person who had a mental disorder, like there was a topic we we're discussing, I think it was a criminal behavior class, and it was something upsetting, and I could mm -hmm. tell by his affect that he was getting worked up, and so right. I kind of 
quickly kind of closed it and went to the next topic because I didn't want the situation to escalate. And I could tell because he was right in front of me, his breathing, I could hear his breathing become more rapid. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, so (laughs) we need to move on. And, you know, just kind of kept my composure because I didn't want anyone else in the class reacting to that. Or I don't think anyone even realized. So that was good. Um, What I was going to say kind of to piggyback with some of the things that my panelists have said uh, to incorporate things into your syllabus uh, ahead of time. You know, I, I know everyone who, who does this, you, you learn and you add as you go by your previous experiences with teaching. Um, I think that with the expectations, like with Beth Ann, like a classroom expectation so that you can, uh, in a sense, create a culture that's mm-hmm. inclusive and mm-hmm. accepting and to say that any sort of behaviors that are not along that line aren't going to be tolerated. So to keep in mind that there's going to be folks from all walks and, you know, that tolerance is mandatory in a class. And I think that that's something that you kind of, when you're going over the syllabus the first day, you have to create that expectation and just say, you know, <laughs> I always give the, I see everything spiel, and if I see you snickering when another student talks, I'm going to give you the death eye, and, <laughs> you know, and that's your warning, and knock it off, you know, and they're like, <laughs> you know, so I think that that is an important thing. Okay. Create those expectations. I've never heard it referred to as the death eye. Usually, it's, <laughs> usually it's the stink eye. Stink eye, uh, but now yeah. I took that up a level. Yeah, yeah, I just clearly. Up. Yes. clearly you, know. you know the one that you know you never had to get hit. You know, your mom just give you that look. You're like, okay. Something to be absolutely feared. Yeah. Um, then, um, for a final question, then we'll open it up to the floor. Have. Um, any of you um, had a requirement, let's say, like in-class participation, uh, that has been difficult for a student um, to um, complete? And uh, how have you accommodated the student in that regard? And I can imagine, um, you know, had I uh, a, let's say, an oral presentation for my student with the hearing impairment, that might have been challenging for her. But as I think back on it, probably not. She would have handled that. Uh, just fine, but uh, I might have had to um, sort of coach her through it ahead of time, perhaps, to uh, make it more comfortable, make her more comfortable, more at ease. Okay. Panel? Uh, yeah. What I do in all my classes, I offer a variety of ways for students to earn those um, participation points. For example, if I have role plays, then a student who is very uncomfortable speaking you know, in front of the mm-hmm. class, that student can be a record keeper in those role plays or mm-hmm. an observer and, and keep notes. Um, they work on discussion boards a lot and they have to develop workshops. So uh, for students that you know, are more comfortable writing, they tend to do really well. Um, in regards to the actual presentation, that student can run the PowerPoint part of it. Something else that's really important, in our program I teach in the Human Services program and we have a lot of experiential type activities and um, I learned this years ago but I take for granted that the activities um, are going to be fine for everyone. I do for example some guided imagery and what I say at the beginning of the class, if you're not comfortable with guided imagery, feel free to you know step out of the room or, or whatever because I did have a situation with a student who had a really serious um, panic attack when I was doing that. Even though it was supposed to be for relaxation, it brought up some very terrifying things for her. So, um, you know, inviting students not to participate can be really important depending on the activity. Mm -hmm. And letting them know that there are other ways that they can earn their participation points, you know, besides, you know, speaking up in class and and being the person that actually does the oral presentation in in his or her group. I had a a student who had a speaking disability. Um, Actually, she learned to speak very late. Uh, I think it was in high school, basically, when she first began speaking. Uh, And here at ODU, when she first arrived here, she's still learning, basically. Um, And it was was a very unusual way of of speaking. Um, It was sometimes difficult to understand. And she felt uncomfortable in the classroom speaking up. So that participation question was was always hard in that respect. Um, But I tried to 
manage that as best I could, and I'm sure that the same way everybody else here would, try to be very respectful uh, and try to be very patient and, and try to set a model for how the other students in the class should um, respond as well. Um, when she did first speak, uh, there were some kind of some kind of gasps in the audience in, in the classroom because uh, they had not heard her speak before and, and they didn't understand what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, it um, the first time I think helped her kind of break through mm -hmm. um, and then she did more gradually during the course of the semester and other than that first time um, the students were, were very understanding, very respectful and, um, and very patient in, in ensuring that she had the opportunity to, to express what it was that she wanted to even though it was difficult to do that but uh, as the instructors of course we need to set the the model for everybody else in in terms of how to respond to a situation like that mm -hmm. yeah. could you perhaps share with us an experience that you've had or uh, pose a hypothetical uh, situation to the panel so that we can explore some other uh, possibilities yes we would take students out on a research vessel, mm -hmm. and we had students with a wide range of accommodations mm -hmm. on a vessel that was um, not all that accommodating. Right. So right. I think the biggest challenge was probably um, uh, getting wheelchairs on and off a vessel when a mm -hmm. vessel is rising up and down right. at the dock with the tide. Mm -hmm. um, so that was delicately done. Mm -hmm. um, but the other one was we had a student with um, a, I, I believe that he was actually legally blind, mm -hmm. um, trying to get on and maneuver about the boat. Um, but we, um, the way we accommodated it initially was mm -hmm. that I gave him a layout of the boat mm -hmm. so that he had an idea of what was, what was on the boat, what the actual mm -hmm. structure was on the boat. So um, as far, he was great as far as he wanted distances from you know, point A to point B, or what mm -hmm. the steps, what the rise and run were for the steps that were on there. Mm -hmm. And we also double checked, and we, we knew that we had handles and railings wherever, but on the edge of that vessel, it wasn't a steady railing. So right. uh, we also, um, because the students were very aware of this, and this was actually a second semester course, um, they had been around, uh, he had been around a lot of the same students before. We were able to pair him up with other a couple other students mm -hmm. that would work as uh, kind of buddy teams, and we just mm -hmm. did that for the entire class. So it wasn't as, you know. So everyone's safety was enhanced, not just um, yeah, you know, it, an assignment to a single student. Yeah. We totally changed the structure of the mm -hmm. way we dealt with it just because we realized that that was a better idea anyway, right, <laughs> having right. all the students buddy up. Yeah. So uh, no one went overboard. And I'm guessing all <laughs> students were wearing life jackets at all times. No, actually, the Coast Guard regulations do not require it. I see. We required yeah. it um, because uh, if, well, we we asked him what his, what his choice was, and he had been prior service, and he is an excellent swimmer. Okay. So he was not concerned about that. I see, okay. Um, and our crew and staff are trained on how to do recoveries, fortunately. Right. Um, <laughs> But um, we, the only thing that's required is that anyone, we increase the requirement that if you cannot swim, you must wear a vest. I see, right, right. But if you could swim, it's Coast Guard regulation doesn't require it because you're a freak. Right. It was interesting. Yeah, yeah. I'm guessing the, um, and, and probably you, you don't even know the answer to this question, but was the ability to swim prior to the sight impairment or did they go hand in hand? Uh, his ability was prior. His his uh, loss of sight was actually due to a stroke. Yeah. Okay. So he right. had been able to swim prior, and he's he also. But that's something that we I discussed with him one on one is, do you swim? How comfortable are you right. swimming with this? And then also, if he had not been comfortable with going out, we would have found I was prepared to adapt an exercise because that was a required field trip. So we're gonna make an alternative trip for him. Wow. wow. But it was wow. a challenge when you say to a whole class you must attend this boat trip. Yeah, of course. <laughs> other um, other examples. That's one's kind of hard to Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> compete with. Yeah. Please go ahead. Okay. 
when you give the cadaver test, that is not something that we can send down to your department. We learn so much at these at these sessions. We really do. Furthermore, this student came to me and gave me her letter, but she said that she did not want anyone else in the room to know. So, what we arranged was, uh, first of all, I said, I'm so glad you're in my class. I've had multiple brain trauma, and now I can talk to someone who understands me. And her face just lit up. Mm -hmm. She had gotten into the class on a situation where if she did well, she could take the grade. If she did not do well, she would get an audit. And she said, I've never, ever been able to, to master something like this. She said, but if I could, it could make such a difference. So we used five, all five senses. Every single thing I taught, I was able to, to verbally, visually, with, with hands, make um, pins with labels so she could post little signs on what each piece of meat was. And, and then- Is that a technical I, term? <laughs> <laughs> but at the end, I, and I want to, this is my point for everyone. She succeeded, she got a high B. She was so excited, mm -hmm. but she said, this class has changed my idea about me. I can do it, and you have helped so much. And so when we see these students, we need to understand this is a crystal opportunity to help them realize they can succeed beyond their limitations. Nice, very good. Very good. One, of, one of the things I've observed with the students that have come in to see me are that they have um, helicopter parents who are also major, significant enablers. That is a technical term, by the way. We <laughs> use that across the university. No, I actually have an award that I issue to members on our staff who are guilty of being helicopter parents. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm soon to be one, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I aspire to become a helicopter <laughs> But um, I guess my question is, I have a lot of questions, but, but two of them here. Um, what uh, are our legal, what, what do we need to know about communicating with the parent? With, these are our traditional age students who have had that parent with them, helping nurturing them along throughout their mm -hmm. And one in particular comes with her son to the appointments with me about him finding an internship. That's what I do. So what do I need to know about that parent and um, what I can tell her? And the second question has to do with um, the student not really being able to cross over from his academic accommodations, this particular student, the academic accommodations and then the kinds of accommodations he will need to be successful in real work when he graduates because they are totally different i i think they come in before classes start they come in the summer to get all registered with us making sure and um, there are there are students who will we have a release form so because we'll never tell you a disability of a student but we need permission to talk to you if necessary and on that release form we tell the students if you want us to be able to talk to your parents you know you can add them in on this release but and I make sure I tell the parents too that I will always communicate with your son or daughter first and when we're in those first meetings I'm directing all the questions to those kids and making sure that they're speaking for themselves um, on the other end and that's particularly students coming in on the other end going out um, I guess really looking at 
what types of employment services might be out there through Department of Rehabilitation Services or something like that to help a person adjust and transition to the world of work. It's, it's a hard thing because there are some of our students with, um, with disabilities, and I know that Penny's seen a few of those coming back too who um, have a hard time adjusting to the work life and maintaining employment. Maybe they'll get the job based on their educational record, but then to have the social skills necessary to maintain it. Um, and what they want to do versus what they're fully capable of doing is something that, you know, they, they involve some long, hard talks, some them having those moments where they realize that this might not be. Um, and do I have the skills to maintain that? I think in this world, maybe things are changing with there are jobs where you can be more working from home or and not saying that that's necessary, but you know, there are options for some of these students, but it's hard. Do we maintain a list of um, internship providers who are especially accommodating to our students who require, um, you know, that kind of uh, extra accommodation, let's say? And if not, we could we perhaps investigate that, or is it something that we? I'm not sure. This is kind of a new idea to me. But I, I would help them by calling, like I kind of get a list of what they were interested in and where they were interested in working, and call those employers ahead of time and find out if they would be able to accommodate students that had um, various different kinds of issues. And a lot of times. You know, if we call them and talk to them, and right. kind of see where they can go and what they can do and what the students are interested in doing, and they will, they'll work with students. So um, that's been my solution, but we don't have really a list, which it might be a good thing to kind of start to develop. start to assemble. Yeah. And I know when I first started working here, we used to work with. Um, it's on. Um, it's over on like Ingleside Drive, Eggleston Services. Eggleston Services, for sure. Services. And sometimes, because of the population that they work with, they were able to help with some, sometimes, um, depending on what the student was interested in. I see. Yeah. yeah, for those of you in the audience, Alice Jones uh, is the Arts and Letters. Um, uh, liaison from the Career Management Center, and uh, Alice uh, has been a, a terrific supporter of PFF, serves on the steering committee, and um, is really the go-to person for career development kinds of uh, questions. So thank you, Alice. That's good. And then we've got Penny Pickle with the College of Business. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, very good. Okay. So the whole team is here today. Excellent. Good. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah. We brought the whole group because we have less. Yeah. That's one thing. We've been seeing these 500 students um, a lot more, and they're looking for internships. And sure. Sometimes it yep. is a little bit um, more difficult to know exactly what to do, how to work with them. And then that we have a, a team of graduate students that are, are sometimes initial contacts. They're the, the internship coordinators, so they're getting those students first. So I think that we probably came to get more information so that we can train our staff a little bit better so that they know a little bit more. Yeah. And I know Tom is working hard, Tom Wanderlust from the mm. Career Management Center, to look at are there is there federal assistance out there also to help us with our mm. students? And that's not right now, it's not. But you know, are there transition type services that we here at ODU could be providing out into the work world that you know, there are only so many people here able to do that, but we are looking together for that. And I think we have to remember too that Section 504 and the ADA also apply in employment. It's not that they will necessarily lose their accommodations. Employers are also required to make reasonable accommodations. So it doesn't end at post-secondary. Maybe not for social skills, but for other um, issues. Mm -hmm. right. I have a student that I've worked with who um, I believe probably has Asperger's or has some characteristics as well as a physical disability that is more of a muscular type of thing, but eye contact is very difficult for him to have, and, and he has a lot of emotion. He has not disclosed anything to me, so I'm just curious as to what can I say? Should I ask? Should I just 
let him wait and see if he will disclose information or just you know, how, to, how to handle that best for you? It's really hard. I mean, I don't know how I would handle that either. And I have seen plenty of students where I'm like, huh, you know, something seems to not be connecting here. You know, and I don't know if it's that they're shy or, you know what I mean? So you don't want to hurt anybody either if there's something more to it. So sometimes asking them, well, you know, what type of feedback have you received in the past? Mm -hmm. You know, asking right. them questions mm -hmm. and they tend to be more comfortable disclosing. Okay. Um, at least for me, you know, that's worked. Uh, would a question like, what do you believe is holding you back be too direct? And that's a great one. Because it, it kind of um, asks the student to be reflective in a way that might, might be difficult, but could, you know, you could, in fact, if the student had no answer, you say, you might think about it, you know, over the weekend or, or whatever, and when we meet the next time, uh, let's explore some possibilities for improving uh, your prospects and see if that gets the student to um, be a bit more forthcoming. Let's say. My, yeah. my, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, quite right. Um, I was just going to say my limited experience with the students I've worked with has been that they are reluctant to be forthcoming with the disabilities that they have, number one, and number two, really don't seem to believe that it's going to stand in their way in being successful. So do you all encounter students that don't admit Honestly, that, that that particular the question you were going to ask, but they really wouldn't come up with an answer to what's getting in my way. It's everybody, everything else that's getting in my way. Right, especially if they've been protected by a helicopter parent for a long time. <laughs> that's a tough question. Um, I have not personally. Um, in, the, in the one situation with the student with dyslexia, he was very forthcoming about that. And so then I was able to make the recommendation, have them seek the accommodation letter. But um, has anyone on the panel um, had a sort of mysterious case that never resolved itself? In my diversity class, I actually have um, Beth Ann will present to my okay. students. And the last two summers, I don't know if I share this with you, after a presentation, I had um, a student in each of these classes that came to me after your presentation and shared with me um, a disability that they had and actually went to your office, yeah, and received accommodations for it. And they weren't comfortable doing that until you presented. Yeah, I was just the other night talking to the Diversity Institute about disability and diversity. And um, I opened it up this time that I did it to, let's go around the room and talk about you, you know, who you are, and what your experience has been in your life with disability, either personally, within your family, within your friends. And it was fascinating. There are 24 students, and at least five of them felt comfortable enough to acknowledge that they themselves personally had a disability within this group, yet none of them were in our, our, my office, were right. registered with us. Wow. So afterwards, they came up to talk about it. So, you know, we're still, I guess, trying to get the word out, too, that we're here. Right. Um, but then the, the rest of them, there are only two out of 24 who did not have direct experience with somebody with disability. Okay. We had a question there. Yeah, yeah I had a two-part question. The first question was, um, some of my students will, in talking about disabilities, will say, well, I heard if I go to the Office of Accessibility, they're going to make me take a lot of tests in order to sign up. So they're reluctant to do that. So I was curious as to the process. And then the second question I had was just more uh, to clarify. Um, you mentioned that with students who were asking excessive questions, you might sit down and talk to them about limiting the number of questions. Mm -hmm. Is that something that the faculty member, accessibility, and the student could do together? Mm -hmm. Um, so we could do a joint meeting. And sometimes I get the letters, and I this semester have a student in my class who doesn't necessarily ask a lot of questions, but wants me to repeat over and over and over. So I need to sit down with him and, and meet with him after class, which is the track we're on now. But I thought, well, maybe it would be helpful if it wasn't just accessibility of the student and me and the student, but all of us together, and even together. better. Yes, yeah. most definitely, even better. And the process is yes, we need we require documentation. Um, for the disability. So yes, in order to get registered, you do have to have assessments of one form or another done. 
and some are easier to do than others. If it's an educational, uh, if it's a learning disability, that's going to be your most involved and hence for the students the most costly. We have a very close relationship with um, a very, very good person in the area who will do um, psychological, educational psychological evaluations for us at a reduced, much reduced student rate. It's $250, but they get a full, whereas others, and I'm sure that you've seen them where it's like they can cost upwards of a thousand plus dollars to get done. So at least it's at a reduced rate. But um, there are other avenues for other types of disabilities and what kind of documentation. So it's not always tests, but we need the documentation. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank our panelists for uh, sharing their insights and uh, Beth Ann especially for providing us with so much information about what we can do to help our students.